Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. Let me uh, back out of the Zoom here. What I've done for you, I've created another PNG paint picture file. Um, this one is all about Jesus blowing fire when he appears to uh, avenge the innocent blood of the saints. This is Jesus' appearing at the seventh bowl. All of these chapters listed here uh, talk about Jesus literally blowing fire on his enemies. Um, if you've ever wondered, are these passages like sending a fire against, kindle a fire, <clears throat> burning against, are they nuclear weapons that Jesus is controlling? Well, none of these are. These are all about Jesus riding on his cherub, his white horse, that's described in Ezekiel chapter 1. And in Isaiah, look right here, Isaiah 30, verses 27 through 33, you'll read all about Jesus literally blowing a stream of fire and brimstone out of his mouth, out of his nostrils, down, out through the bottom of his cherub, the glory of the Lord, onto his enemies. And Isaiah 10, verse 16, proves it that this is not nuclear weapons that Jesus is going to use at his coming. Again, I'm not saying that nuclear weapons aren't going to be used prior to this, but at the seventh bowl appearing of Jesus Christ, he literally, underneath of under his glory, means under his cherub, under the glory of the Lord, he shall kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. And we know from Isaiah 30 that it's literally a stream of brimstone and fire coming from his nostrils. All right, so all of these chapters, burden against, the kindle of fire against chapters, and the send of fire against chapters, uh, I've got them listed here. I'll, I'll zoom in for you here in a second for those of you using smartphones. But Jesus is going to thresh, tread, and trample from Baghdad to Cairo. That's found in Isaiah 27, verse 12. Why? Because he has to cast out all who offend. And not just in what we consider the nation of Israel, but remember, Israel gets extended boundaries during the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ. You see that in Ezekiel chapters 47 and 48, and there's other places as well. So, between the Euphrates River Basin and the Nile River Basin, Jesus is going to clean house. All who offend all who who are enemies of uh, the Holy One of Israel, his father, God, the Father, the Ancient of Days, the power, the majesty on high, anyone who's uh, an enemy of Israel, anyone who's an enemy of the cross must be cast out, must be cut off, must be killed at the seventh bowl battle called the battle of the great day of God Almighty. I don't know for sure how many days it's going to last. I know it begins on the last day of the age. Um, the actual battle part of it. But I, I, you know, my best guess would probably probably be seven days like the fall of Jericho, but can't say for sure. But the great wine press is the Jordan River Valley. And when you measure it, and I have measured it, I'll probably do a video actually showing me measuring it. Um, unless I already have, but I don't think I've actually shown the measuring. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, just a few days ago I did do a video on that. I sure did. Where the, uh, the, the Jordan River Valley from north to south, south being the Basra Jordan area, is 200 miles, 1,600 furlongs. Uh, so, when all of these enemies of Israel and the cross, led by the Antichrist, who shall come from Mosul, Iraq, says Nahum chapter 1, Al-Mazil, the god of Mazil, Magog, says Nahum chapter 1, which is a seventh bowl chapter, by the way. Um, they're going to follow him, and they're going to come against Israel. And the siege of Jerusalem shall last for 430 days. And we know from Zechariah, that's Ezekiel 4, Zechariah 14 tells us that Jesus is going to come and appear 
uh, when the seventh bowl is poured, just as 50% of the city of Jerusalem goes into captivity by these nations who are bum-rushing her, if you will. All right. Uh, what we don't know is how many people in Jerusalem are going to be killed while these uh, men with axes and hatchets and everything else are going up into the windows of the, of the buildings in Jerusalem and raping and pillaging and plundering. What we don't know is uh, how many inhabitants of Jerusalem are going to be killed. We do know that just as 50% are led away into bondage, that's the moment Jesus appears. Now, do we know what day in the future that day is? No. No one knows except Father. But we do know that it won't be any more than a certain length of time after certain events occur. You know, God is good. Uh, for example, Daniel 12 tells us that uh, no longer than 1,335 days after the fifth seal abomination of desolation event will be the resurrection to life. That is the appearing of Jesus Christ. We also know that 1,290 days after that same fifth seal event, that abomination of desolation event in Jerusalem, you need to look that up. We don't have time to talk about it in this lesson, but... That's 1,290 days. That's when we will see Elijah and Moses rising from the dead in the streets of Jerusalem to signify that the court in heaven has reached a verdict, Daniel chapter 7, and awarded the kingdom to the saints. But we have to wait forty-five, no longer than 45 more days to the seventh bowl appearing of Jesus Christ. I hope you'll check out my, diff my various timelines on the 70th week. But again, this is a neat uh, <clears throat> file or chart, if you will, of all of the seventh bowl passages in the Bible that refer to the, the stream of fire and brimstone, the breath of the Lord coming from underneath the cherub that he's riding on. So again, Jesus is going to kill millions on the mountains of Israel especially the Jordan River Valley, the low elevation areas that stretches for 1,600 furlongs. Okay, blood's going to be up to the horse's bridles in many places in that Jordan River Valley, especially in the uh, Kidron Valley there between the Mount of Olives where he'll be, when he jumps off of, leaps off of the bow and he comes off of his cherub and he stands on the Mount of Olives, that little Kidron Valley also will be just full of blood. Um, but, again, all of these chapters, at least portions of the chapter or the entire chapter, are about the seventh bowl appearing of Jesus Christ to render his judgment fire. The earth is not going to be destroyed, but there's going to be a lot of fire seen in the Middle East, in the clouds, coming down to the earth. That's what Second Peter 3 is talking about. All right, and I wouldn't be surprised if it also involves all the satellites in the upper, upper atmosphere and just outside of our atmosphere. All of these circling um, satellites that are going to have to be taken out of commission. He'll probably burn those up too. But let's look at this list. This will really help you when you're trying to determine if chapters in uh, books like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Nahum and Zechariah and Hosea and Amos are these seven bold chapters. And if you've ever kind of sat the fence and you're trying to really choose, is he? It is 70th week. It's not 70th week. It's only past prophecy. It's future prophecy. This will help you, brothers and sisters. And you know exactly what I'm talking about if you study eschatology and you sit there and you rub your chin and you go, well, I'm not really sure. Is it future, past? This will help you. Once you understand that the burning against phrases, the kindle of fire against phrases, and the send of fire against phrases are the stream of fire and brimstone coming underneath of his glory while he's riding on his cherub, his white horse, down onto these peoples. And again, it consists of these peoples, these fighting men, bum-rushing Israel and especially Jerusalem, um, when the siege of Jerusalem is coming to an end and that gap forms in the wall, 
All right, allowing the flood of jihad to pour in and to take away one out of every two people in uh, in Jerusalem. That's uh, again Zechariah 14 verses 1 and 2. So the fighting men on the mountains of Israel shall die, and then Jesus is going to ride on the swift clouds with his whirlwinds and his lightning show and his earthquake and his 66 pound hailstones the size of a Hebrew talent says Revelation 16 verses 17 through 21 and many other places and he's going to go visit the family members in these cities of these fighting men that that are rushing Jerusalem so let's zoom in and look at this list I'm zooming in for those with uh, smartphones Isaiah 13, Baghdad. Yes, Baghdad will be Babylon the Great. We know that because Revelation 18, 21, tie a stone passage, thrown into the sea, matches uh, Jeremiah 51, the way it ends in verses 62 through 64. So Baghdad will be Babylon the Great City once again. Isaiah 15, Northern Jordan. Isaiah 17, Damascus, Syria. Isaiah 19, Egypt. Isaiah 21, Wilderness of the Sea. Isaiah 21 also is uh, Saudi Arabia. Isaiah 22, against the Valley of Vision. Isaiah 23, against Tyre, Lebanon. Isaiah 30, against the Beast of the South. Nahum 1, against Nineveh, uh, Mosul, Iraq. Now again, remember, Jesus is only visiting cities between the Euphrates River and the Nile River basins. You know, you're probably also talking about Ethiopia and Egypt and uh, um, Turkey. Uh, now, is he going to go personally to Iran? No, but he has lots of weapons of, uh, that he can use at his disposal. He has man of dust armies that he can use to send to Iran. All right, that, you see that in Jeremiah 49, 50, and 51, and Isaiah 13, these assembly of great nations from the north who rejoice at the exaltation of the Holy One of Israel, these Christian crusader nations, which America, if we're still here, might be leading or might be a part of. All right, so, but Jesus isn't going to visit any cities east of Baghdad. He's not going to visit any cities East, I mean west of Cairo, the brook of Egypt. Again, that's Isaiah 27, 12. But all of these neighbors of Israel, he is going to personally visit and kill all of their marked family members. But first, he's going to start in the Jordan River Valley and in Jerusalem and in the Armageddon area around the hill of Nazareth, what the Matthew 22 refers to as the wedding hall. Um... He's going to go visit all of these cities. So continuing on, let's see, uh, Zechariah 9, again, Damascus, Syria. Now you see in the red here, chastisement and purification. Uh, when, and you say, aha, brother, that proves that you must be mistaken because Jesus isn't going to blow fire on Israel, on Judah, and on Jerusalem. And the answer is, you're wrong. He is going to blow fire on these cities in these mountains and you might say well wouldn't he be killing his elect Israel my elect well that's why Jesus is getting the good Israelis the family of God out of there are you listening to what I'm saying prior to Jesus appearing at the seventh bowl to purify it to turn it into a furnace to um you got to get that because Zechariah 13 says that two-thirds of Israel will die, all right, long before Jesus ever shows up. In other words, the, uh, the chastisement of Israel, which is the curse and the oath that shall pass over seven times. That's the um, sixth seal through the end of the sixth bowl. Okay, Israel's got to pay for their transgressions and their iniquities. If they don't bow knee to Jesus and let him atone for their sins, this last generation, says Deut Deuteronomy 32, will have to atone for their own sins. And that's exactly what's going to happen if they, if they um, bow a knee to the Antichrist during that fifth seal period. Then boom, here comes the sixth seal. Time has expired on the clock. 
Here comes the curse and the oath that shall pass over seven times, the seven trumpet judgments. If Father is forced to do it, then Zechariah 13 says that two out of every three people in the nation of Israel shall die. Except for Jerusalem. Jerusalem, we don't know the stats on it. We do know that it's so bad in Jerusalem at the end of the 70th week of Daniel that one half of the city will be taken away into captivity. Now, in regards to the other half, whether they get killed or not, once these nations, by the millions, bum-rush that gap in the wall, all right, and start climbing into the windows, we do know that Jesus says, if I don't come back when I do, there'd be no flesh left alive. Now, we always think, oh, he's talking about on planet Earth, with some degree that he is. But what he's primarily referring to, there would be no flesh left alive in Jerusalem. That's where his focus is. All right. On the city of David, on Judah. All right. Jerusalem. That's where Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is focused on. He's talking about, man, if I don't hurry up and save the day. All right. Half of the city, though, as part of the judgment by father, must go into captivity before Jesus returns. But the other half, they're, they're, they're killing um, the women and children and the old men and women who all look like Holocaust victims because they've just been through a 430-day siege. They're all getting killed. In other words, if you look like you'd make a good slave laborer, you're being led away as captive to these beast cities. Do you get that? To these beast cities. But the other half... The old men, the old women, the children, the women, all right? They're being raped. They're being killed. And Jesus has to hurry up and show up or there'd be no flesh left alive in Jerusalem. That's what that's talking about. But again, these notes in the red about the chastisement, that's the curse and the oath promised in Deuteronomy 32, promised in many places, especially the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel Chapters 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, uh, uh, Ezekiel uh, 21, okay, Israel's going to have to pay for their sins since they didn't bow a knee to Jesus prior to the sixth seal loosing. That starts the curse that shall pass over seven times. Uh, now the kindle of fire against Psalm 106, against the wicked Mark Tares, Isaiah 9, uh, Isaiah 10, again, uh, that's the under his glory, under the glory of the Lord, proving that these aren't nuclear weapons. Not here. This is the appearing of Jesus Christ, literally seen blowing fire out of his mouth, the face of him who sits on the throne. Uh, Isaiah 30 proves that. Uh, Jeremiah 11 is chastisement of Israel. But remember, again, uh, I didn't finish talking about Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13, two out of three people are going to be dead anyways, long before Jesus shows up in Tel Aviv, in Haifa, in Bethlehem, all Golan Heights. They're already dead due to sword, famine, war, pestilence. Uh, but the other third in those cities will be taken away as slaves long before the seventh bowl. Remember, there's no Israelis left in the cities of Israel um, by the time this siege of Jerusalem comes to an end, the other cities have already been removed. They've either died, two out of three, or one out of three shall be led away into captivity. The ones that look like they make good labor slaves. All right, they'll be under the yoke, the Bible says. All right, so it's sad. I don't wish this on Israel. I am Israel, but this is what the Bible says. Zechariah 13 and 14 give you great stats on Tel Aviv, Haifa, Jerusalem. Uh, it's sad, but the, it's it's there. That's why they need to bow a knee to Jesus prior to the sixth seal and tell the Antichrist that comes from Mosul to go take a hike. Um, but that's what uh, against Israel, against Judah, against Jerusalem. You have to read the chapters, okay? Um, sometimes they're talking about the chastisement, these seven trumpet judgments, and sometimes they're talking about Jesus showing up at the seventh bowl and literally blowing fire like a furnace to purify them because he's already gotten uh, his people out of there, either by death or by the yoke of slavery. 
Jeremiah 43 against Egypt, Jeremiah 49 against Damascus, Jeremiah 50, uh, Baghdad and her bullies, Lamentations 4, Zion, Ezekiel 20 uh, against the forest of the south, Ezekiel 24 against Jerusalem, Amos 1 against Lebanon, Damascus, Syria, Gaza, and Jordan. And Obadiah 1 against the house of Esau, southern Jordan. Come over here to uh, the catchphrase, send a fire against. You've got Ezekiel 39 against Magog and those in the coastlands. Magog, brothers and sisters, is Mosul, Iraq. Um, in Arabic, it's Al-Mazil, M-A-W-S-I-L. Okay, that's Mog. That's Gog from the land of Ma, M-A-W. All right, and and it's I'm not guessing. And the reason why I know I'm right is because Nahum chapter one says I'm right. All right, that's how I know I'm right when I make that claim. Nahum one, brothers and sisters, is all about this day, the day that Jesus appears at the pouring of the seventh bowl to judge the nations and to avenge. He comes with vengeance. This is. The final day of the day of vengeance, day of the Lord. This is the day of vengeance. This is the day that he comes to blow fire and destroy all who offend. All right. That's what Nahum 1 is all about. Once you get that, brothers and sisters, you realize that, wow, we are told where the final Antichrist will come from. It's from Mosul. Is al-Baghdadi him? No, but al-Baghdadi might be the one that's listed in Daniel 11, uh, verse 19, might be, the one whose body shall never be found, might be. Now, if he is, we must take note that the final Antichrist shows up on the scene, and he co goes forth from Mosul at verse 21 of Daniel 11. Just two verses later comes the final Antichrist. It's not the next guy. The next guy is verse 20. But verse 21, then comes the real deal, the final Antichrist from Mosul. Uh, Hosea 8 against Israel, Amos 1 against Damascus, Syria, Gaza, entire Lebanon, and southern Jordan, Basra. Remember, Basra is mentioned in Isaiah 63. Very important. That shows where Jesus will begin his threshing, treading, and trampling. He'll actually begin, remember the Bible says, the tents of Judah shall be saved first at the appearing of their Messiah. That's exactly why Isaiah 63 says that here he comes. All right, Jesus with his blood-soaked garments comes from Basra, Jordan. That's Isaiah 63, brothers and sisters. But today Jordan spells it B-A-S-I-R-A, -S -S Basra. And you will see it on Google Earth. It's in uh, south of Petra. And that's why the Bible says Jesus will begin saving the tents of Judah first. In other words, south of Jerusalem, southern Judah. All right. That's where he's going to start his threshing, treading, and trampling. Now, is Jesus going to appear at high altitude above Bethlehem, Ephrata? I believe so. And then descend at an angle so he could actually, when his whirlwinds touch down, they touch down uh, in Bas Basra, Jordan. I believe that's the case. I've always said that Jesus will appear and meet his bride above the well of salvation, above Jesse's house. That root of Jesse, the root of David, the branch shall go forth from Bethlehem Ephrathah. Micah chapter 5, and everybody says, oh, that's just about his first coming. No, you need to read it again. That's about his second coming. So I believe we'll meet at high altitude above Bethlehem Ephrathah, but at high altitude, it's not much of an angle to descend, uh, you know, a few miles south of Bethlehem down there to Basra, Jordan. That's where the world winds will touch down. Hallelujah. And you say, brother, you're just giving too much detail. It can't all be there. It couldn't have all been there for 2,000 years. Because you're the first person I ever he heard talk about this level of detail. Brothers and sisters, I'm not claiming that everything that I'm saying is correct. I'm not acting with a haughty spirit. All right? I'm humble. But I put the time in, and for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit is giving me these things so I can give them to you. I'm not writing a book, at least I have no plans yet, 
I'm, I'm just a humble, instructed scribe, honestly trying to get as much detail as I can from these passages. So don't hate me, just praise God with me. He's giving us this level of information. It, his whirlwinds will begin at the tents of Judah first in Basra, Jordan. And then he will start northward and arrive at what time? Over Jerusalem? Are we told? I didn't say what moment he appears. I said what mo moment does he appear over Jerusalem? It's at evening time, twilight. It shall happen. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you getting it? That's Isaiah 17, 14, uh, Zechariah 14, 7, and where else? I just found another one the other day. I'm trying to remember. But anyways, um, here's something interesting. Genesis 24. All right. Genesis 24, that story of Isaac and Rebekah. Remember when their eyes, well, before their eyes meet, when she's still... Uh, back with her family, all right. Um, she comes out to draw water at evening time. That beautiful virgin comes out to draw water, and Abraham's servant is it Eleazar? I'm trying to remember, anyways. He knows that she's the one based on what he's been told, all right. She is the one, Rebecca. Now, when and, and Rebecca comes and uh. You also have her eyes meeting Isaac's eyes for the first time. That's that's pretty cool. But anyways, we're told in a lot of places in Scripture that Jesus is going to appear to save the day of those who are in Jerusalem at evening time, twilight, time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Uh, oh, here, I've got them listed right here. I'm sorry. Here are the three passages that uh, talk about Jesus beginning to thresh, tread, and trample at Basara, Jordan. I had him right here in front of me. I'm sorry. Zechariah 12, verse 7. Isaiah 63, 1. And Zechariah 9, 14. So Zechariah 12, 7 talks about saving the tents of Judah first. Isaiah 63, 1 is that passage talking about the match to Revelation 19. Jesus' garments are blood-soaked coming from Basara. All right, it literally tells you that. And then Zechariah 9, 14, the appearing of Jesus Christ at Jerusalem, it says that his whirlwinds, in other words, he and his armies are coming from the south, you know, south down the Jordan River Valley, all the way to Basra. So it, it all matches, brothers and sisters. Um, will We, his bride army and Jesus, our commander of the Lord's army, will arrive over Jerusalem at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But, um, you know, what time, what hour of the day will we be, meet our Lord in the air just prior to our beginning to thresh, tread, and trample at Basara, Jordan? I don't know. No one knows whether it's a few minutes before we arrive at Jerusalem or is it hours. I have no idea. But I do know what time we're going to arrive at Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Uh, here, Luke 12 is pretty cool. Have you ever noticed this? Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. All right. And in other words, it hasn't been kindled yet, but it will be at his second coming. The unbelieving enemies of Christ will be consumed at his coming. Now, people will read Luke 12, 49 and go, well, that's just that passage about him coming to divide. Light from darkness, the seed of Satan versus the, the seed, capital S. All right. Um, true Israel. The seed cast by Jesus. Um, it is about division. But he is literally talking about the result of this division. This separation of the two seeds. The seed cast by Satan and the seed cast by Jesus. You read about in Matthew. <coughs> Jesus really yearned to have his torture and his crucifixion over with. But he also wished this day was over with too. This is the day that Jesus has to come back and kill millions of people to set up his kingdom. And if you say, well, brother, you're some sick dude. How can you claim to be a Christian? No one's ever worded it like that. I'm wording it like that because the Bible words it like that. Okay. Uh, not because 
Um, and I realize that that's not popular, and it may even turn some people off when it comes to Jesus. So I thought he was the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace, but on this day, this which I believe are multiple days, this battle of the great day of God Almighty, when he cuts off, consumes, casts out all who offend, um, he's slaying, he's killing, he's avenging, he's making war. That's what Revelation 19 says. All right? Millions are going to die by the breath of Jesus when he comes. I don't want to spend 99% of my time talking about Jesus in that way because it does turn a lot of people off. But if you are a mature Christian and not a babe in Christ, you need to understand that that's exactly what Jesus is going to do. You need to teach it at least in your adult study groups every now and then. Don't uh, read things like this in the Bible and go, oh, don't understand it. I don't want to make the Lord mad in case I misunderstand it. I'll close it up and put it away and we'll go sing for a while. No, you need to open the Bible up every day and read these things. Okay, you need to understand. This is going to strengthen you because you, bride, are going to be here during the 42 months that Satan comes to make war against the saints and those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ and those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's Revelation 13. You're going to be here. That's not talking about some Israelis that become Christian. Don't listen to those people, brothers and sisters. You're going to be here. You're going to make Father very proud. In fact, the Bible teaches us that there'll be more Christian martyrs than anyone can even count. Okay, that's not the rapture. The rapture is at his appearing on the last day of the age. Hallelujah. Don't fight it, brothers and sisters. Just get ready. Get your congregations ready for it. Get your families ready for this great deception that's coming. Um, but I hope you uh, find this pretty helpful. At the bottom, I have uh, written all of this promised destruction takes place at the seventh bowl takeover of the planet by Jesus. The battle of the great day of God Almighty. The only exception is the promised chastisement of Israel, Judah, and Jerusalem that takes place during all trumpet judgments leading up to the appearance of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, just a few other things to show you uh, before we end this lesson. Let's see. At the top here, I've got written how to easily understand prophecy. Remember, the Bible was created for the poor and needy. Don't make it hard. The poor and needy are mentioned a few times in the Bible. And that is a title that he gives the elect, his bride. So um, he, he, he does. He, he gives us the title of poor and needy. That kind of gives you the, the understanding of who it is that he's going to tell his father, I know this one. This one is mine. Okay, so if you have a haughty spirit and you, and you do all these great things for Christ, you better fear God, all right? Because the Holy Spirit doesn't reside in you if you are uh, of a haughty spirit, all right? You better uh, fit right in when it comes to the poor and needy. But if the Holy Spirit resides in you, you are saved. Jesus will thresh all his enemies between Baghdad and Cairo. Again, that's the... Uh, the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt. That's what that's talking about. Isaiah 27, 12. Jesus and his whirlwinds will start at Basra, Jordan, in the southern Jordan River Valley and begin working their way north, eventually arriving at the wedding hall around the hill of Nazareth. And then spend many days visiting these cities. Hallelujah. So, let's take a look at um, my easy timeline of the 70th week. You see it from the start of the 70th week, the first six seals, the seven trumpet judgments that pass over seven times, that curse and the oath promised to Deuteronomy 32. And then, of course, the, uh, the bowls of wrath, the, uh, my assembly of kingdoms gathered to the wedding hall. Then you have the appearing of Jesus Christ after 50% of Jerusalem goes into captivity on the last day of the age to begin the battle. Uh, I'll mention it now. My next lesson will probably be explaining why this day of the Lord's start at the sixth seal is actually a little off by a few days. Did you catch what I said? Because the day of the Lord, 
does not have the same start date as the curse and the oath, the seven trumpet judgments. Uh, Daniel 11, verse 40, when there's that big battle between Egypt and its confederation, in other words, uh, Western Turkey, Lydia, <coughs> Libya, Ethiopia, all join with Egypt and make that final assault up near the Euphrates River Valley. And you say, well, brother, that happened in the past at Gargamesh, up near the Turkish border of the Euphrates River. That's a past battle. You need to understand that Jeremiah 46 is a seventh week of Daniel chapter, and, it's and it matches Daniel 11, verse 40, which is a 70th week of Daniel chapter. All right, Father does this. This is how he warns the last generation that is going to have to uh, face Satan. He gives you the playbook. It's already written. Daniel 11, verse 40, the time of the end battle is not the battle of the great day of God Almighty at the seventh bowl. This is towards the end of the fifth seal period. All right. So the day of the Lord, you see in Jeremiah 46, actually begins at this battle. And it begins the day of vengeance. It begins the day of the Lord. It be, Okay, so because there's going to be this huge amount of uh, loss of life at this final battle. It's not the, the final battle at the seventh bowl when Jesus is doing the fighting. We're talking about this final attempt by Egypt, Ethiopia, in other words, Northeast Africa, uh, to include Turkey, Lydia. They're going to attack the caliphate, king of the north, at the Euphrates River, kind of like what happened in the past. But Father says this begins the day of vengeance because I am going to enjoy, in a sense, watching them try to fight each other before they come against Israel. They're going to come against Israel uh, a few weeks later at the sixth seal. All right, six seal, seven seal, first trump are all the same day. All right, they're going to realize after this time of the end battle of Daniel 1140 that, hey, why are we fighting each other? Let's go get Israel. But there's going to be a huge Muslim Islamic loss of life, this final battle between the king of the south and the king of the north up there by the Euphrates River somewhere. You know, is it Ramadi, Raqqa? Uh, indoor, I mean, where is it? Gargamesh, somewhere along that river valley. Again, just like kind of in the past, it's going to happen again. Here comes this start to the day of the Lord, the day of vengeance. But that actually begins uh, weeks prior to the sixth seal. That's going to be towards the end of the fifth seal period. But I'll, I'll talk more about that, how I can prove that in probably the next lesson. But this lesson, we're dealing with just the seventh bowl. But I wanted to show this to you. Uh, and all of these are available to download from either my Keep and Share link or a, a Google link. Um, now, I entitled this, really, uh, this PNG file, I entitled it, Behold, It Shall Happen, Behold. And here's why. Because... 80-90% of all the beholds in the Bible are referring to the seventh bowl appearing of Jesus Christ. And it's, in other words, they're all the match to Revelation 16-15. And what I've done is uh, I've created in the past a Word document that shows all the beholds in the Bible that all deal with the seventh bowl return of Jesus Christ. And yes, it's Father's plan that we find this uh, pattern and talk about it. Uh, am I the first one who's ever noticed this? I have no idea, brothers and sisters. And I don't. I don't even say that phrase trying to sound haughty. I don't know, but it sure is uh, a neat thing to have um, once you've been given this understanding by the Holy Spirit. These all match. Now you may say, "Well, brother, it sure looks like they do." I wish I had the chapter and verse listing. Why didn't you include that? Because I included at the end in the same exact order. The reason why I did that is you won't see, oh, that's an Isaiah verse. That must be past. Or that's Jeremiah. Oh, that must be past prophecy. No, when you read it like this without knowing the chapter and verse, then you realize 
In other words, all the confusion that you had, these preconceived notions, are not coming into effect. And you can truly understand that these are all about the resurrection to life, the rapture of those who are alive and remain, the appearing of Jesus Christ to render vengeance and make war. All right. This is all about the seventh bowl, battle of the great day of God Almighty. Okay, you see the New Testament there in blue right here is the verse that they all match. It's the uh, what's mentioned in Revelation 16 just prior to uh, the pouring of the seventh bowl by the seventh angel on the last day of the age. Hallelujah. Now here you see the uh, chapter and verse listings in the book listings in order. Uh, I really am surprised that this isn't circulating more amongst people who, uh, who study eschatology. I guess the word just, I'm not doing a good job getting the word out, but that is, oh, here's the late edition I made. Here's the moment Isaac and Rebecca's eyes meet for the first time. That's Genesis 24. Pretty cool. And the virgin who had come at, came out to draw water. Hallelujah. Uh, but the it shall happen that's mentioned throughout the Bible, not all the it shall happen passages. In fact, I think I have the three listed. Here they are right here. Isaiah 23, 15, Zechariah 12, 3, and Zechariah 14, 7. These three passages, the it shall come to pass, it will happen, it shall happen, uh, it shall happen. When you read those, this is the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, he, there's plenty of other passages in the Bible that talk about the appearing of Jesus Christ. But I wanted to, to point that out to you. That's the glory of the Lord. That's when the fire comes. Looks like when you're down on the earth looking up, it's coming from underneath the cherub. Yeah. A consuming fire that uh, Malachi 3 and 4 calls it the refiner's fire that comes burning like an oven. That's the wrath that we are not appointed for, the wrath of the Lamb. When they see the face of him who sits on the throne spewing out this uh, stream of fire and brimstone. And people say, I just can't picture Jesus doing that to people begging for mercy. Well, it's too late to beg for mercy on this day or during this battle. Okay, Remember Revelation 14, the 9-11 passage of Revelation 14 tells us there'll be no mercy. I mean, Jesus is going to blow fire on all of those who took the mark of the beast. There's no exceptions. You can't talk your way out of it. It's the day of your execution. All right, you were marked for execution when you take the mark of the beast. Now, is it 666? Literal numbers, or is it something else? I have no idea. We know it has something to do with calculating the number of the Antichrist name, but I don't, I don't know what it's going to be. But I do know if you bow to this uh, caliphate Mahadi who's claiming to be God, all right, um, and uh, and you come against Jesus Christ, you're going to regret it. Hallelujah. So, brothers and sisters, let's go ahead and end this lesson. Uh, I hope this PNG file is a blessing to you. Uh, we'll end this now, and I'm going to get uh, started on the next video, which will be um, a better understanding of the time in the end battle that's mentioned in Daniel 1140 and Jeremiah 46. We're going to take a look at that. And that actually starts the day of the Lord. I have been mistaken this whole time as far as the start event of the day of the Lord. That six seal darkness is signifying that the curse and the oath is going to begin. But the day of the Lord, day of his vengeance, actually begins late in the fifth seal when we have that big battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, which will allow the king of the north at the sixth seal to start reconstitute himself and start heading south and pass through and pass by uh, the mountains of Israel. And he's really focusing in on northeast Africa, uh, all of the... Um, oil and gas in the eastern Mediterranean Sea and all of these gold mines up and down the Persian, uh, up and down the Red Sea. And uh, 
yeah, the King of the North is really making a push towards Cairo at the Sixth Seal, which will affect and begin uh, Israel's war with him. But anyways, that's the next lesson. I hope you'll uh, uh, view that as well. But I hope this is a blessing to you. I'll get this, uh, get these links posted sometime today so you can download this. Uh, all right, brothers and sisters, can't wait to see you next time. God bless.